This video is for learning outcome four for the unit one exam and it's all about the different target audiences for media products. So these are the specification points. You need to be able to define the different audience terminology. So that's the key words relating to audiences. You need to be able to explain demographic profiles of audiences and you need to evaluate how certain media products meet the requirements of a certain target audience as well. So some of the key terminology relating to audiences is passive and active and that li this links quite closely with learning outcome six where you've got to talk about the effects of the media. Some theorists say that audiences are passive and some say that they are active. If you're a passive audience member, it means that you're more likely to accept what you're seeing on the screen. So you're more likely to be influenced by what you're watching or listening to. If you're an active audience, that means that you're basically able to tell the difference between the fact that you're watching something that isn't real and that you can create your own meaning from what you see on the screen. It also means that you're less likely to, to be affected by what you see. Another key word is mainstream. So if an audience is described as mainstream, it means that it appeals to a wide range of people. So the aim is to get as many people as possible to be interested. And one kind of down point to it is it's quite difficult. It's very difficult to please everybody. A niche audience is when the audience is supposed to be small and targeted. So it's usually based on when there's specialist interests, skills or beliefs for a particular product. So these two examples here, if you take, take a look at whether they are niche or mainstream, if you think about the fishing magazine, I would say that that is very niche because there's only certain amount of people that are interested in fishing. And if you're not interested in fishing, then you're not going to read that magazine at all. If you think about Empire magazine, that is definitely a lot broader audience. So you could describe it as mainstream. Even though it's targeted at people that enjoy films, I would say that the majority of people are interested in films or some sort of video entertainment. So you could argue that this is mainstream because the audience is a lot bigger. Another key word that keeps popping up is demographics. So demographics is the term used to describe people in a certain particular group. So the best and most obvious examples are gender, age and class. They're the ones that pop up the most. So an audience can be categorised or grouped demographically into what gender are they, what age range do they fall into and what is their social class. You can then go into a little bit more depth and look at their education, religion and so on. One theorist is called John Hartley. In 1978, he classified seven socially grouped categories, so seven demographic groups. Basically saying that you can put people into a category based on gender, age and class, as we've already discussed. Thinking about family, do the people have kids or do they not have kids? Are they a big family? Do they not have any, relate, um, any interest in children whatsoever? You can look at nation. What nation are they from? For example, James Bond. A lot of the people that watch it will be from England or Britain. Ethnicity. What kind of um, ethnic background are they from? Are they white? Are they black? Are they uh, mixed race? Are they Chinese? Those kind of things. Then also the self. So ambitions or interests of the audience. So when it comes to demographic profiles, there's something called social grades or social classes. And these are basically used to classify audience into a particular social class. There are six different categories, A, B, C1, C2, D and E. And what they usually do is split it into half just to make it a little bit more simplified. 
So you can have ABC1 and C2DE. Now what they usually do is say that a product falls into ABC1 at a particular percentage level. So for example, if a product falls into ABC1 90%, then 90% of the audience fall into A, B or C1 and only 10% fall into C2, D and E. So when you look at the actual social grades, you can see that that's the population of the UK and which category they fall into. So only 4% of the UK fall into professional, administrative and high managerial. When you look at the bottom, only 8% fall in the, under the category of being unemployed of being state pensioners or casual workers, somebody who works for maybe minimum wage on not the most regular hours. So something that falls into C2DE, social category, at a high percentage, you're looking at products that are more aimed towards people with less education and a lot less money. So to profile an audience, there's different techniques that you can use and you'll learn about different types of research and different types of things that you can do to find out about your audience in the next learning outcome. But one way that we can use secondary research is to use companies such as the NRS, Rajar and Barb. The NRS has now changed its name to Pamco, but they do the same thing. So let's take a look at the different um, companies that gather the data for you and see what their data looks like. So NRS or PAMCO are basically supplying figures about magazine readership. Rajar is Radio Joint Audience Research and they supply listening figures for radio stations. Barb is Broadcaster Audience Research Board, which collates viewing figures for major broadcasters like the BBC and Sky. If you look at some examples of the data, here's an example of some PAMCO data, and this is looking at magazines. So magazines that are released weekly, it's looking at how they are actually accessed. So are the digital ones downloaded or are they purchased via print? And it shows you the statistics in thousands. So we're looking at angling times, for example, printed copies, 153,000 copies are sold each week in the UK. Then if you take a look at something like the Radio Times, you probably say that that is more of a mainstream audience. We're talking over a million people that buy the Radio Times and it covers all sorts of different bits of information. It has all the radio programmes on, but it also has the TV programmes. It has lots of um, kind of stories about stuff that's going on. So this data is gathered by this company and you can use that to analyse things. So say you were a company and you wanted to advertise one of your products, you could use this data and say, right, I want to put an advert in a magazine. Now, say it was something like a watch and you, you were trying to sell like a really fancy, expensive watch. You can use the data from Pamco to decide which magazine would be best for you to put it in. And we'll look at that on the next page. So this PAMCO data is from one of the past paper exams and it's looking at newspapers. And what we can see here is we can see that it gives you data about the social class and the age range. Now you could look at this data. This is some Rajar data, which is showing all of the different radio stations that they've looked at and seeing how many people it actually reaches. So what's the population that they examined and how many people are being reached by that particular um, radio station? You're also looking at the average hours listened to per person. 
then what we can look at is the total amount of hours that have been listened to for that radio station as well. And by putting this into rank order, it lets us see straight away which are the most popular radio stations. So obviously in this set, the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The first nine are all categories, so it's like all of them put together. The first time where it's an individual radio station is BBC Radio 2. And that is the most popular. It's saying that it reaches 15 million people in the UK. It's also saying that on average, 12.1 hours per listener. So people listen to Radio 2 for a lot longer than they do for any others. Now, one of the reasons for this is because Radio 2 has things like plays and interviews and things like that on, which you're going to listen to for a longer period of time. One reason why BBC seems to have done a lot louder than Heart and Capital is that BBC doesn't have advertisements, so people don't turn off because the adverts come on. So in other words, you're driving to work, put BBC Radio 1 on, you're less likely to turn it off because there's constant entertainment. So these are the kind of statistics that you can use to make some sort of analysis of what's going on. If you were wanting to advertise a product, putting it onto the BBC would be great if you could put adverts in because they've got the most listeners. This is all of the barb data, just an example of one particular set is looking at one TV show and we're looking at the different audiences that have viewed this TV show. This is really useful because straight away you can just see that the major audience watchers for British Bake Off are women between 25 and 34. So when that is on the TV, if you wanted to advertise a product for that program, you would advertise a product that's targeted at women between the ages of 25 and 34. So usually this could be something that maybe help them with their kids if they've got children, something that might be for them, such as like dresses, perfume and makeup. What it also shows is PC, tablet and TV. What are they watching it on? So according to this, the most popular is people using their computer to watch Great British Bake Off compared to only 10% of watching it on the actual TV. All of this data allows us to create these fancy things called infographics, where it's like a nice visual way of representing an audience. So this is by using some NRS or PAMCO data, and it's created a profile for the Kerrang reader. So the Kerrang magazine has got a reader uh, audience profile where the gender is pretty evenly split but more towards males it's 50 50 almost for abc1 so it's got a lovely range of um, abc1 and c2de readers and then you look at the age range and it's saying that the majority are 15 to 24 so straight away you can target advertised products at a huge range of people there you can target the females, you can target the males, you can target the rich, you can target the poor, and you can target people of the age range 15 to 24. So a psychographic is where you use all of the data from the demographics, but you add in things like their interests, so hobbies and interests, and it's moving away from that kind of categorizing people by gender, like all men like football, all women like soaps, that kind of thing. It's moving away from them and going more into hobbies and interests. And if we look at Ian Ang's theory in a second, that kind of reinforces this point. So what a psychographic is, it's basically a description of who would read or watch the product. What are their interests, values, beliefs and opinions, rather than what gender are they and what age are they? So Yen Ang basically is a theorist for media and said that producers have got their ideas about an imaginary audience they've got in mind. So you might think I'm making this for all men or I'm making this for people between these ages. But what we're finding more so now is it's not really about the demographics but more about the psychographics. In other words, it's not about age and gender but more about what people's hobbies and interests are.
So to summarize psychographics, it is people's opinions, beliefs, values and interests. And you get that from qualitative research. You can't really categorize people using multiple choice questions. You need to ask people what their beliefs are, what are their opinions, why, what are the values, what are they interested in and why. So in order to do this, producers try to stick to this kind of list of different categories of people. So each category has got kind of characteristics that are applied to them. For example, for a resigned person, you are tend to be rigid, strict, authoritarian and chauvinist values. In other words, kind of sexist, strict and really kind of straight down the middle. You, if you are under the explorer category, you like you have experience, so you tend to be older. You kind of like the, uh, the theory of adventure. You like challenge. You like going out and experiencing new things. And then you could have something like an aspire, where they are kind of more important about brands and identity and materialistic things. They even create these little profiles where it's like a picture of what they kind of look like. So you've got resigned, rigid, strict, authoritarian. You can see this guy, he just kind of looks exactly like that description there. A struggler, this kind of just looks like a little typical Jeremy Kyle guess, doesn't it? Feels alienated from everybody else, struggle, disorganized, with few resources and skills, drink a lot, eat junk food and play the lottery. So they're kind of categorizing people into these particular things rather than saying that are all male or all female or a certain age. So just have a look through all of these as they pop up rather than me talk through each one. You can just kind of see the picture and see the description and it kind of makes it a little bit more sense when you're thinking about psychographics. So here's another example of a sad uh, psychographic, a reader profile. It's kind of showing all of the images of things they might be interested in. What type of products might be um, shown in NME? What are like the key statistics? How many are male? How many are female? What's the average age? How many are students? How many fall into ABC1 category? All that kind of stuff. But also what are they interested in? What kind of things do they like as well? So you might be thinking, why is all this important? If you look at this, this is how much it costs to advertise in NME magazine. So you could basically think, right, I've got a product that I want to advertise and I'm going to put it in NME. You, I, you identify NME as having a similar audience to what you're looking for. And then what you do is you look at how much it's going to cost to advertise in it. So where it's got like outside back cover, inside front cover, Everyone knows that when you get a magazine, you turn the front cover, there's nearly always an advert on that inside page. So what it's saying is that inside front cover costs £8,000 to advertise something on that first page as you turn in. That might seem like a lot of money to you, but to get that kind of awareness out there of your product with that many readers, some might say it's a decent investment. But there's no point in advertising something if the audience of that magazine is completely different to you. For example, if this is mostly males, there's no point in you putting a picture of dresses as an advertisement. So one thing that you might need to talk about is a little bit of theory about how you actually fulfill the audience needs. So how does a product meet what the audience wants? And one little theory that reinforces that is Dennis McQuail. He said that there's four categories that offer insight into why people choose a product. So why did you choose that magazine? Why did you watch that TV show? Why did you pick this film to watch? He said that there's four categories. Now to simplify them into as basic as it can get, you think in escapism, so to escape from the reality of the real world, surveillance, which is where you want to find out information. Personal relationships, so it's to create conversations and have talk about talk with others about some sort of product. 
and personal identity it's to help you find yourself help you find your own identity and image by watching or consuming another product so to apply the uses and gratification model you can just give some examples so for escapism an example could be avatar and the reason why is because that allows you to delve into a completely imaginary world with everything is different, completely different plants and animals than you've ever seen before. Surveillance could be Blue Planet. And that's because it's showing you what is, is in the real world. It's showing you what things are like in the real world. And it's helping you to learn. Personal relationships could be things like football, the X Factor, popular mainstream content that you can talk to others about and fit in. Personal identity could be things like soaps and magazines about celebrities because it helps you kind of develop what your life is like and maybe see what others are like and see who you can relate to. So another theory that kind of links to audiences is Stuart Hall's reception theory. So what he's saying is that people are actively engaged in the media but they can interpret the media in different ways. So what that means is you've got three different categories according to Stuart Hall. You can have the dominant people where they just accept the media message. So where the media is completely dominant and they just take everything they say as gospel. Then you have negotiated where they might accept some stuff that they say but disagree with some of the other content. And finally, you've got oppositional, which is where people just outright re reject what they're seeing in the media and create their own interpretation. So the examples of this is people that dominant would be everyone that believes everything they see on the news as being true. You have oppositional at the other end, where they're like, no, it's a load of rubbish, loads of rubbish, don't believe it. And then you have negotiated where they might say, I can see their point and I can see where they're coming from. However, I think this. Finally, some language that um, relates to audience a little bit is connotation and denotation. Now, denotation is the literal meaning of something. So when you see a word, you take the literal meaning of it. If you see the literal meaning of something else, like in a film, someone walking out the door means that they are leaving. If we're talking about connotation, it's when something is suggested. So the best example of this is something like the word unique. Now the denotation of unique would be the definition of it. So what is the actual meaning? And that means that you are completely and utterly unique. You are the only person of your kind. Now the connotation behind that could be negative and positive. The positive could be that, yeah, I'm unique. I'm really special. I'm brilliant. I'm great. However, the negative connotation of unique is that you could, you're could a bit weird and you're not like anybody else. You're just a total freak and totally weird compared to everyone else. That's the end of Learning Outcome 4. 